Well, maybe you thought you had a bad weekend. You know, maybe uh, you think Kadarius Tony had the worst weekend. Well, I got someone with a worse weekend than any of you, than any of us, than Kadarius Tony, than the Chiefs wide receivers, and uh, that is the former staffer for Maryland U.S. Senator Ben Cardin. So this story, this is, I mean, I don't know why this dumped on a Friday, but the story dumped on a Friday, and it was leaked amateur pornography that shows a a congressional staffer for Ben Cardin having sex with an unknown man in the Senate hearing room. This video was obtained by the Daily Caller, and it was dropped late on Friday. And not that I encourage anybody to go see the video, but uh, I'll read it to you here. The alleged staffer can also be seen in a photo naked on all fours, looking back at the camera on the table, where senators often sit to ask questions during a hearing. A source identified the room uh, as the Senate Room Heart 216, the Judiciary Room. The Daily Caller blurred out the face because the identity at that point had not been confirmed. But we did find out eventually that this uh, was a staffer who had worked for Ben Cardin out of Maryland. And one day after this took place, this video was leaked on Friday. By Saturday, this staffer was out. Sayonara, see you later, goodbye. So while we don't have 100% confirmation that this staffer is the person in the video. The staffer, whose name is Aiden Masse Zerposki, did put out a statement on Friday night and then was relieved of his duties for Senator Ben Cardin by Saturday. And in classic victimhood fashion in 2023, because this is what we do, you go and you screw somebody in the Senate room and somehow you become a victim. And by the way, you videotape it as well. But somehow you're the real victim here. So uh, this staffer, Aiden, who also happens to be gay. So if I didn't tell you that part of the story when I was getting the whole thing out the first couple of minutes, he is gay. So he was with another man in this Senate hearing room. He put out a statement on Friday night. He didn't unambiguously deny involvement. Instead, he wrote, this has been a difficult time for me as I have been attacked for who I love to pursue a political agenda. How dare you? You have got to be kidding me. This guy goes viral because he's having sex in a Senate hearing room and he turns it into somehow it's because he's gay. No, no, it's really not. I No, I, I know that those of you inside the Washington, D.C. Beltway want to celebrate heathenism every turn you can possibly uh, get. But no, it's just wildly inappropriate what you did, allegedly. It's unbecoming of somebody who has given access to important buildings in the United States Capitol. And it shows wildly poor judgment, and it shows that you're not up for the job. That's what it shows. It's not about you being gay. It's not about who you love. It's not about pursuing a political agenda against a Democratic staffer. No, that's not what any of this is about. You know, I've been to D.C. I've dealt with many of these staffers. And, yes, there's a lot of young people there who maybe don't have the best judgment at times. That's often the case with many young people. And these staffers are oftentimes on the younger end, especially interns and things like that. But it's one thing to have poor judgment. It's another thing to come to the conclusion as, I think he's about 24, 24 24-year-old, that uh, you're going to videotape yourself having sex in a Senate hearing room and risk the possibility that that gets leaked out. So, This staffer, Aiden Maese Zaraposki, also puts up, while some of my actions in the past have shown poor judgment. Oh, Talk about a bombshell. I love my job and would never disrespect my workplace, he says. He says he would never disrespect his workplace. 
after an alleged video of him having sex with somebody gets leaked out to the media in a Senate hearing room. Any attempts to characterize my actions otherwise are fabricated, and I will be exploring what legal options are available to me in these matters. Let's see if he can get fitted for a size 7 jumpsuit in orange. (laughs) That's right. We're going to see what legal options are available to him, aren't we? Yeah. You know what? What a pair of stones, huh? (laughs) I mean, you are the guy who is the one busted in the Senate hearing room doing something as ridiculous as allegedly having sex with somebody, videotaping it, and you've got the audacity to say, it's been a difficult time for me. I'm being attacked. I'm going to be exploring my legal options. Everything about this story is America today. Do something wrong morally and potentially legally. I've seen some stories about that. Mm Mm-hmm. And then after you get caught doing said immoral and potentially illegal thing, you check off the box that classifies you as a victim, scream and play your victim card, and then claim that you're the one who's going to be pursuing legal options. This is America in 2023 in a nutshell. This story right here. Disregard for rules, for decency, for everything. Get caught doing it and then claim that you're the one that's getting attacked here. Unbelievable. So this kid um, has been booted from uh, Ben Cardin's staff, Maryland U.S. Senator. He's been shown the door. And this is, boy, I don't know if this is rich. This is ironic. uh, But it's something. It's something, John. I wonder how many people in the audience are thinking of a a joke using the word insurrection like (laughs) I am. (laughs) Well, the good news is you got three hours and 48 minutes to get a good joke. What day was this? Because we'll have to put the first letter of the month and the date that (laughs) happened this thing. Like J6. Yep. Well, I'm going to designate this. I'm glad you brought up J6 because I've got video of Ben Cardin, Maryland U.S. Senator, after January 6th, talking about January 6th, and take a listen to what he had to say. This is the boss of this aide who was just caught having sex in a Senate hearing room. January the 6th, like December the 7th and September the 11th, is a date which will live in infamy. I refer to U.S. Capitol as sacred space because it's so much more than a building where the Senate and the House of Representatives meet and conduct business. It is the embodiment of our ideals, our aspirations, and hope, not just to Americans, but also to all of humanity. It's not just a place where people do business. No, it's clearly not. We, we now have seen that firsthand. Thank you very much. It's not just, it's a sacred building where if you walk around with a MAGA shirt on, boy, you better watch out. But if, you know, you're stooking somebody, shh. Have fun. You're the real victim here. What a world. 913-408-7957 on the text line. Pete, remember when decency was supposedly on the ballot back in 2020? That's an excellent point, 7028. That's what we were told. Decency was coming back to D.C. And apparently now we know what decency really means coming back to Washington, D.C. Unbelievable. Now, speaking of Washington, D.C., you know, we are now inside of a month to the first presidential vote in 2020. You know, we haven't done this wall to wall because there's not a lot going on. Frankly, it's not a ton to talk about, but we've got less than a month to go. And there's some new polling in one of the first states, and it shows something very interesting. We'll get it to you next on KCMO Talk Radio 95 7 FM. So this past Friday was one month until the Iowa caucuses. Can you believe that? I, you know, I, I say this as somebody who does this for a living, but um, <laughs> I will add that I, I feel like this hasn't been a typical presidential primary. Like, there's been these debates, but the guy who's most likely to be the nominee is not at the debates. Yes, there's, you know, primary presidential politics happening two and a half hours to our north in Iowa. But let's be honest. No one's really looking at it that way. No one's really thinking about it like that. Because Trump keeps dominating in all the polling that's getting done. 
And it was a great weekend uh, for the Trumpster for a multitude of reasons. First off, he goes to the UFC fight. Um, and if you didn't see it, I mean, the guy got a hero's welcome as he strolled into the UFC event. I mean, and who is in the building? But former president Donald Trump, escorted by UFC president and CEO Dana White. And they are all rising inside T-Mobile Arena to pay their respects. So that was at the UFC event um, over the weekend. And I'm watching this, and I'm like, I mean, seriously, Trump still got a little swagger in his step. I'll give him that. Well, Biden is just trying to, like, not fall off the stage or trip up the stairs. Trump still kind of has that, you know, slightly hunched over, kind of, you know, swagger back and forth as he's rolling into an arena. It's pretty impressive. I'll give it to him. Then he also finds out, we find out over the weekend, that the supposed uh, mastermind, and I use that word with air quotes, Behind Ron DeSantis's big pack, the Never Back Down pack, Jeff Rowe, a guy who started his career in Kansas City. Jeff Rowe resigned from the Never Back Down pack. This is an operation that had hundreds of millions of dollars to spend on behalf of Ron DeSantis. It was supposed to be part of the reason that Donald Trump was not going to be the nominee. And Jeff Rowe, who is uh, the biggest name in Republican politics when it comes to running campaigns. He's the president and owner of Axiom. Um, All the big races typically have an Axiom candidate in them. Here in the Kansas 3rd District, Amanda Atkins, the last two cycles, Axiom candidate. Uh, You know, he did Ted Cruz's 2016 presidential campaign. That was kind of his coming out party, I guess you would say. He ran Glenn Youngkin's campaign in Virginia. Anyway, big piece in the Washington Post over the weekend talking about how this DeSantis campaign flopped. And within hours of that piece coming out in the Washington Post, Jeff Rowe announces he's out. So that's also good news for Trump. And then last but certainly not least, more polling. This from Fox News showing that Donald Trump's support in the Republican primary has gone up from last month. So right now, 2024 presidential nominee preference amongst Republican voters. This is nationwide. It's not in the state. It's nationwide. Shows Donald Trump now at 69%. In November, he was at 62%. Ron DeSantis is in second place at 12%. That's down from 13% last month. Nikki Haley, down from 10% to 9% this month. Vivek Ramaswamy down from 7% to 5%. Chris Christie down from 3 to 2%. And somehow there's still 1% out there hanging on with former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutch- oh, sorry, Asa Hutchinson. Excuse me. So Asa Hutchinson still polling at 1% somehow in this Fox News poll. So I'm looking at this and I'm saying, what are we doing here? I mean, we got the Iowa caucuses coming up for the month and maybe DeSantis pulls a rabbit out of a hat. Maybe there's a minor miracle and Ron DeSantis somehow is able to, you know, pull it off because the caucus process is different from a traditional primary up there. And he does have the support of the governor. He's got a lot of the um, uh, faith leaders supporting Ron DeSantis. And I get it, by the way. I do. But My job is to not just sit here and say, well, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe. It's also to look at the reality and say, how does any of this actually happen? Because if DeSantis somehow does end up pulling it off in Iowa, which doesn't look likely, what's after that? New Hampshire. And there was also some polling over the weekend, courtesy of CBS News, that shows Nikki Haley closing in on Donald Trump in New Hampshire. It shows Trump at 44 percent, Nikki Haley at 29 percent and Ron DeSantis all the way down at 11 percent in New Hampshire. So even if DeSantis does does well in Iowa, he's going to lose all his momentum by New Hampshire, which is the second state. And that primary takes place on January 23rd. I can't believe we're a month away from all this happening, but we are. 913-408-7957. John is in uh, Grain Valley. What's up there, John? Good morning. Listen to the show, good show always. And I've been really struggling with do I do Trump or do another candidate? And part of it is 
I think, like you said it earlier, Trump still has that swagger, still has that shine. And I think for a lot of people, they're starting to say, who's going to fight for me? Who do I know is going to get in the trenches and go live and fight for me? And you saw Trump do it. You saw him do it on the world stage when he, he called out the Germans for sending billions to Russia for gas while we're paying billions of defense. And he said, not right. You know, you got to step up. When he told the U.N. off, when he told these other people, when he sat with Pelosi and Schumer and said, no, I'll take the heat. I'm not afraid to take the heat. I'll take the heat. And you look at these other candidates, and can you really see them upending and being that disruptor and saying the status quo is not working for the average person? Bidenomics has screwed them. The border is screwing them. Who's going to get in there and really get down in the mud and fight? And the only person you know who has done that for years is Donald Trump. I mean, can you honestly see him sit, any of them sitting with a Pelosi Schumer and on live TV when they had that, just calling him out in front of everybody? I, so I, you're still stuck. Mm-hmm. They're all playing for second place. And it's like, Ron DeSantis said a good thing. We need someone who can do two terms. And I agree with that. But I need, we need someone who's going to stop this stop what's going on now like you said day one we're gonna we're gonna stop this immigration this illegal immigration and like you said they're not being they're not sending their best and brightest to us and he's right <laughs> yeah he, he is Remember, right about quote, that you you look down the line on things that finger quote trump said and or predicted would happen and he's got a pretty good track record he does so i i don't know i'm stuck on it but i do know we need someone who's going to fight for what we think is right and put America first. And what's I've always asked, what's wrong with that? Yeah, what's nothing. What's wrong with saying, I'm going to take care of our house first. We're sending hundreds of billions overseas, and what are we getting out of it? Yeah. Hey. John, so excellent me, points. Why should I pay your tab? Excellent points, my man. Excellent points. Uh, well done there by John in Grain Valley. It, listen, that's the problem that a lot of people are going to have to try to figure out right now. What's in it for you when it comes to looking at Donald Trump, who did it very successfully for four years? Or do you pass off the torch to a guy like Ron DeSantis, who I don't think you can question his conservative credentials, but you did see Trump do it for four years. Do the legal woes scare you or not? But by the way, there's a part of this poll that I haven't even mentioned yet. That might be the best part of it for Donald Trump. I'll explain that next on KCMO. Well, a happy Monday. Got a uh, Chiefs victory yesterday, and uh, Donald Trump, I got to imagine, is all smiles this morning. Not, you know, not because I think he's probably a Chiefs fan. Good to see us snap that two-game losing streak. By the way, Kendall Gammon will be here in a half hour. But because he got much more favorable polling over the weekend, this time a Fox News poll. And I shared that with you before the break. It showed Donald Trump in a uh, GOP primary. This is a national poll. Up. 57% on Ronnie D. 60% on Queen Nikki. And uh, he's up 64% over that huckster Vivek. He's up 67% over Doughboy Christie. And he's up 68% over Asa, uh, sorry, Asa Hutchinson. I mean, he's dominating these polls. But the most important part of it, The most important part of the poll is not that part of it. The most important part is that in the head-to-head with Joe Biden right now in this Fox News poll, Donald Trump wins 50 to 46 nationally. Now, Nikki Haley theoretically beats Joe Biden by a wider margin, 49 to 43. But the big talking point for Ron DeSantis has been what? Two terms, electability. Ron DeSantis is neck and neck, 47-47, with Grandpa. Who would have saw that coming? I mean, Ron DeSantis has said for the better part of six months, I'm electable, I'm younger, and I've got two terms. But this is not the first poll that's shown this. It's not the first poll that has shown Donald Trump doing better against Joe Biden than Ron DeSantis, which tells you a lot about the Ron DeSantis campaign And how disappointing it's been in large part. And I say that as somebody who is very high on him. So some of my, I love this over the weekend. Um, 
some of my social media trolls brought up a tweet from me from last January. I love how I'm in these people's minds where they find tweet from me from 11 months ago, and then they promote my tweets from 11 months ago to try to own me. And it's like, no, 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 guys, you're spending your weekends looking at my tweets from 11 months ago. Trust me, I'm getting the last laugh here. So anyway, uh, they start promoting this tweet from 11 months ago where Ron DeSantis was here in Kansas City at the Jaguars game when the Chiefs played the Jaguars in the playoffs in that divisional round matchup last year. And it shows Ron DeSantis walking through Arrowhead Stadium before the game. And obviously there's Chiefs fans all over, and they're high-fiving the guy, they're shaking his hand, uh, they're telling him to run for president, the whole thing. And it's looking back on it, it really goes to show you how quickly Ron has tanked this thing. I think of that with myself. You know, it was here, and that was right at the beginning pretty much, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I can't remember if the book was out yet. You know, we are like, oh, why is he here? Well, obviously they were playing, who were they playing? Jags? Yeah, the Jaguars. Yeah, right. So Jacksonville makes sense. He would be there as the governor. Yeah. So he was here, and, you know, he has this great moment. And I tweeted out at the time, as Ron DeSantis is glad-handing in the first row of Arrowhead Stadium, I can't think of any other political figure in my lifetime who would receive this kind of treatment in a city halfway across the country from where he governs before ever announcing intentions to run for president. And I stand by that. I mean, I stand by it because I can't think of anybody else. I mean, leave Trump out of it because he's already been president. But I mean, somebody who's just a governor, who's just a run-of-the-mill politician getting that kind of response. And this is, you know, a couple of months after the guy won his re-election in Florida by 19 points. I mean, he was flying high. He was coasting. And now in a head-to-head per a Fox News poll, he's neck and neck with Joe Biden. I mean, how is that even possible if you're Ron DeSantis? Now, do I think things will tighten up if and when Trump becomes the nominee? Yes, because he's going to have the legal things going on next year. The media is going to be relentless. It's never going to end. But still, we're sitting here today with a Fox News poll coming out over the weekend that shows Trump does better against Biden in a head-to-head than DeSantis, and that's the final nail in the coffin for Ron's campaign. I might have a different opinion than you on this, but to me, one another sign was when you let Vivek be the new kid on the block all of a sudden without really kind of stepping up and... You know, That's a great point. You know, yes. because he's an outsider. The others, you know, they're politicians, so he, you know, he doesn't really have to say anything about Christie or Haley per se. Mm-hmm. They're in the government. Yes. But the outsider comes in, and now he's the shiny new thing. Right? That's a great point. Yes. Vivek certainly took some of that and ran with it um, and, and was kind of the new hotshot young kid on the block, making all the cool points and having the viral moments and things like that. And it just wasn't going to work for Ron. Steve is in uh, Lenexa. Go ahead, Steve. You're on KCMO. What's happening, big fella? Hey, hey, P. Good, good show today. I'm enjoying it. Um, the, the the thing about Ron is that he his time is in the future. I mean he's he's got a uh, he's got a big future ahead of him. So I wouldn't be worried about DeSantis. We need to worry about the fact that Nikki Haley is plus six over uh, over Biden, and she's never going to be vice president. I, I don't know if you saw it, Steve Bannon on Friday kind of floated out the list of vice presidential uh, uh, women. And I, and I kind of wanted to get your opinion about that. Um, Christy Nome is pretty much smoking hot. I mean, I would, I would vote for her. She could be the next Sarah Palin, but I, I got to think that Marsha Blackburn is probably your vice presidential candidate or, or maybe a Stefanik, but the Blackburn communicates better. I don't know the, Bannon says they're going to pick a woman. So, yeah. Well, so I'm, glad, I, 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 I'm glad to hear you're very concerned with policy of these individuals versus you know, <laughs> uh, what they look like, Steve. I mean, well, I, I can't lie. Uh, I can't lie. Gnome, Gnome is Gnome has uh, got the policy, and she's got the she's got well, the swag. But <laughs> no, no one asked you to lie. No one asked you to lie. I, I just, I just, I just hoped you'd be a little bit of a deeper thinker than that. But I guess nothing should well, surprise me at six forty one on a Monday morning. <laughs> She's got a great brain too, but the rest of the package, the rest of the package is all right. I mean, okay, all right, I, I, I get, I get I, it, I get it. All right, now let, let me answer your question, okay? Before you start getting hot and heavy, it's yeah. too early for that, okay? <laughs> uh, that, thank you, Steve. Uh, I will answer your question here. The question was, and I think it's very obvious, Trump does have to pick a woman. And take it easy there, Steve. All right, easy does it. 
<laughs> Jeez. It's a little early, Steve. Okay. So Trump has to pick a woman. I agree. The names that are floating out there. Christy Nome. Steve's a big fan. Governor of South Dakota. Arkansas Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Uh, Senator Marsha Blackburn out of Tennessee. Elise Stefanik, who is a New York congresswoman. She's second or third right now in the uh, GOP in the House of Representatives. Nancy Mace, a congresswoman from South Carolina. And then Carrie Lake, a, a grifter who ran for office in Arizona and lost. Now, of those options, I would go with Nancy Mace out of South Carolina or Elise Stefanik out of New York. Christy Nome in he, because here's the thing. Trump can't have somebody who he fears will outshine him. Right? He can't. And Christy Nome, South Dakota, really doesn't bring you a lot to the table. I, I like I, I Trump doesn't need to shore up any kind of like conservative base like John McCain did when he picked Sarah Palin. Doesn't need to do that. Sarah Huckabee Sanders, I, I mean, you know, she's been obviously loyal to him since she was press secretary. Nice. I, I don't see the appeal there. Like, who is bringing you voters that you might not otherwise get? Christy Nome's not doing it. Sarah Huckabee Sanders not doing it. Carrie Lake's certainly not doing it. Marsha Blackburn's not doing it. Elise Stefanik and Nancy Mace might be able to do it to some degree, because Elise Stefanik is in New York. She's young. She's a mother. She may appeal to women in suburban areas in a way that the others won't. And similar storyline for Nancy Mace. It's about which one of these appeals to maybe more uh, suburban swing women voters that helps you close the gap if you're Donald Trump. And of that list, Elise Stefanik out of New York State and Nancy Mace out of South Carolina, both in the House of Representatives are the best bet. Um, but I do agree, Trump's got to go with the female. There's no doubt about that. Well, unfortunately for Stephen, there is no evening gown competition. Uh, <laughs> so he's just going to have to pick from the list. I think. <laughs> yeah. Now, is. your reasons make sense, right? Like yeah. you say, the Carrie Lake, certainly former TV person, she's all in, you know, and Trump's anonymous there. So that doesn't bring anybody extra to the party. For that's, sure. the, that's the only thing the yeah. VP really needs to be about. Do mm-hmm. you have a chance to, yeah. you know, Pence... What did Pence do for Trump? The questions among evangelical circles. Was Trump really going to be conservative when it came to certain social issues? Mike Pence shored that up. John McCain shored up conservative bases using Sarah Palin or tried to. So that's really what this comes down to. And that's how Trump's got to be thinking. 913-4087-957 as we roll to 7 o'clock. We are going to be joined, of course, by our good pal Kendall Gammon just after the top of the hour. Talk about the uh, Chiefs win over the Patriots yesterday. Coming up next, uh, the story of this of this mayor doing something outwardly racist matters. And I'm not going to let it go, and I'll explain why next. Uh, interesting tweet here, or a text I want to share with you, 913-408-7957. That's our text line and our studio line on 95.7 FM KCMO Talk Radio. Uh, Pete, best best VP pick for Trump is Vivek Ramaswamy. At first, I said, that's insane. The guy's, you know, just been a clown in these debates. But then I thought to myself, after seeing that text, maybe that texture is on to something. Because it actually would soften Trump to have a guy as smarmy as Vivek Ramaswamy as your running mate. So it might not actually be the worst idea. But then the texter says, next VP pick should be Carrie Lake. What has Carrie Lake done outside of Kiss the Ring? Like, what has she done? What does she do? Who does she secure for you? How does she make your boss look better? (laughs) She does none of the above. She barks louder than DeSantis. I guess. You know, if you. A lot of people like noise, they like the noise. There's that whole thing with her. Here's the thing, though, John. With Trump, you get plenty of noise. Oh, I understand that. That's why they like her. <laughs> you know. Yeah, but Trump doesn't want to compete with his VP on noise either. No, he either. doesn't. But, you know, we think of it. It's like when I was a kid, I thought it'd be great if Alice Cooper was the singer in Kiss because they both all wore makeup and everything, you know. <laughs> it's stuff like that, you know. Okay. All right, that's Wouldn't some analogy. we had Derrick Henry on the Chiefs? It's By the just way, a fantasy thing. You beat Bill O'Reilly to the 1970s analogy this morning. <laughs> that's so. right. I didn't give him a chance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no. 
The I noise, s- I think it appeals to people who like noise. I guess. I, I've got enough noise in my life. You know, I got two toddlers. Uh, we're going to have Trump running for president again. I, I don't need more noise. No. I, I need less. We need less noise Maybe is what so. we need. Maybe so. I got a third one coming. I mean, geez, we got plenty <laughs> of noise. So, uh, meantime, this story, I, I'm not going to let this one go um, because it matters too much. And it's from last week, and, and uh, we were over it, all over it last week, where the mayor of Boston had a coloreds-only Christmas party. Sorry, never a Christmas party. Holiday party. They sent out an invitation accidentally to all of the city council members there in Boston, Massachusetts. But it was only intended to be an invite for those on the city council and those elected leaders who are of color. So Michelle Wu is uh, the Boston mayor, and she never apologized for having a coloreds only holiday party. She apologized for it going viral and accidentally sending it to everybody. That's what she apologized for. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I have this fundamental belief that no matter your race, we all have more in common than we have different. Yet here's another example of the most powerful progressives in our government believing that those minor differences, like the pigmentation of our skin, is enough to keep us constantly separated. And it's a mentality that continues to permeate these actors in our government, including the Boston mayor. So she holds this elected officials of colors only holiday party. She accidentally sent it to white people. And she was in no way apologetic about this late last week. I think we've we've had individual conversations with everyone so people understand that it was truly just a, an honest mistake that went out in, in typing the email field. And um, I look forward to celebrating with everyone at the holiday parties that we will have besides this one as well. So um, it is my intention that we can, again, um, be a city that lives our values and create space for all kinds of communities uh- to come together. Lives our values. By the way, we'll see you at the other holiday party, Whitey. Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to have one for white guys smoking cigars. Come <laughs> in for that. No chicks. Yeah. <laughs> When's that one? When, yeah. Right. I mean, you got to be kidding me. The aloofness, the arrogance. There's two things that are so bothersome to me. One is the obvious, right? Literally having a holiday party in 2023 where you can only go if you have a certain skin color. Says Michelle Wu, who, in case you were wondering... Married to a white guy. Seems to be a common theme, but that's neither here nor there. Um, And the other part of it is the fact that you've got this continuing mentality of politicians across the spectrum who just can't say, boy, I screwed that one up. Jeez, you know, that, that, that was a mistake. You cannot apologize in politics in America in 2023. And it's one of the biggest problems that we have because it's not how the world works. You apologize I apologize to family, friends, spouses, you know, uh, colleagues at work. We all do it. Not that you, you know, get on your hands and knees and beg for forgiveness. But, hey, sorry, you know, I screwed that one up. That's on me. My bad. We all do that. But we are in a political environment where if you apologize for anything, you are showing weakness. It is true for Donald Trump. It is true for Quentin Lucas. It is true for Michelle Wu in Boston. They never apologize. They never admit they're wrong. And it is such a turnoff. And I'm telling you right now, I don't know what election cycle it happens, when it happens, but somebody's going to come along here in the next couple of cycles who's actually going to be like a human being, who's going to do some of these things that aren't real popular right now that nobody wants to do, and it's going to work. I don't know who. I don't know when. I don't know what the tipping point is going to be and what it's going to take. But at some point, the pendulum is going to swing back to hopefully just the middle. I don't want some, you know, sympathizer apologist, but someone who can at least say, yeah, you know, I might have gotten that one wrong. That wouldn't be the worst thing to have. And then you have Michelle Wu up there. And here's what's amazing, too, about having a party like this. This is another way for them to celebrate themselves. By pretending that they're special for being a minority in government. Minority progressives don't actually want equality. They want special treatment. And they always want one more than whatever the people without color get, including one more Christmas party. That's 
the only thing they're in the business of. Because progressivism inherently carries a victim complex and an inferiority complex. And they have this forever appetite for being treated like delicate flowers. That's always what they've wanted. That's always what they've strived for. And now they essentially get to give it to themselves. And it's a mindset that is not going anywhere. In fact, it's only getting worse. And it's allowing them to throw holiday parties based on one's skin color and not apologize for it. In fact, double down on it and brag about it. Did you see this from last night during the uh, Chiefs game? So, of course, Taylor Swift was there, um, and she was wearing some local swag, which is uh, very nice of her and very cool once again. But, you know, I noticed, and I started seeing this on social media, um, I didn't think Fox overdid it when it came to Taylor Swift cameos. They'd sometimes show her, but they wouldn't, like, tell you who it was. They'd just say, oh, there's Taylor Swift. And then Joe Davis, the play-by-play guy who does a very good job, uh, once in a while he would reference her. But it wasn't obvious. It wasn't too much. It was just kind of, like, appropriate. Travis makes a catch, Joe Taylor. Travis, you know, gets seen, uh, almost makes a catch, Potential penalty. I'll get to that coming up. Uh, They show Taylor. But then I saw on social media that at Gillette Stadium in Foxborough, where the Patriots play, they put Taylor on the big screen, on the Jumbotron. And she was sitting next to Brittany Mahomes and her own father, Scott. And I thought that was so small market and so tacky. You know, I've been to a couple of games this year at Arrowhead where Taylor is at the game. And they've done the classy thing. Never show her. You would not know that Taylor Swift is at the game since she's been coming to the games at Arrowhead Stadium. They just, uh, they're not showing her on the Jumbotron. They're not doing the whole, like, you know, mid-sized city. Whoa, we have a celebrity here. This is so cool. Let's show her on the Jumbotron. (laughs) They're taking the, the big city approach. Which is, yeah, Taylor's here. It's cool. We don't need to tell you guys a hundred times. And by the way, she would get a standing ovation at Arrowhead if they showed her on the Jumbotron. But they take the classy approach. Meantime, Gillette Stadium, Boston, Massachusetts, big top ten city, diverse city, cultured city, uh, Harvard, MIT, you know, all the fancy universities. And they're showing Taylor Swift. Like, oh, look who's at the game. Taylor's at the game. I thought it was so cheesy. I thought it was so small market of Boston, of all places, to do that. To act like celebrities don't show up to Celtics games all the time, which they do. And they had, obviously, celebrities at Patriots games when Tom Brady was winning Super Bowls left and right. I just thought it was so cheesy. And it made me proud of the Chiefs for how they've handled the Taylor Swift thing. They can't control what the TV networks do. But in the stadium, I've never heard of them, and I've never seen it the last couple of games, ever show Taylor on the screens in either end zone. And that's a credit to the Hunt family. And it makes you come off like, hey, it's great that she's here, but we don't have to brag about it. We all know she's here. And I thought that was pretty cool. And I feel like how Foxborough handled it yesterday was a total disaster. But there was a Taylor moment that stood out. And I know John was very impressed because John and Taylor had a moment yesterday. John felt like Taylor was just like him. Sitting on the couch, (laughs) sitting down, cursing at the game, letting it rip. It looks like she dropped an F-bomb after Travis appears to have dealt with a pass interference in the end zone. Now, I didn't think that was pass interference. I thought he was selling it a little bit, and I didn't think he should have gotten a call there. But there was that moment. I want to say that was the first half, right? When Mm -hmm. Travis is in the back right corner of the end zone. Mahomes is looking for him. He lofts it towards him, and he kind of gets knocked over by the defender. But I thought it was a little NBA-ish of Travis where he was trying to get a call there, Yep, and he didn't get the call. And then they jump to Taylor, and she pops out of her seat appears to drop an F-bomb, and I'm like, this girl's in the football now. That, that's, I needed that. That is the moment that signaled to me, 
Taylor Swift is now an NFL fan, John Anthony. What about you? Well, never has an F-bomb come from a redder shade of lipstick. <laughs> yeah. For sure, right? That's it. Yeah, that's it. Kind of easy to discern the word. I know that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everyone's trying to figure out what Patrick Mahomes was saying mm-hmm. after the Tony <laughs> interception. We all know what Taylor was saying up in that, uh, up in that suite when she thought Travis should have gotten a P.I. flag on that play. That should be a new meme emoji. (laughs) Well, if you saw it when she was named Time Person of the Year, there was that quote, and I'm paraphrasing it here, where she basically said, I don't care if the Chads and Brads are upset with me for being at games and the TV network showing me. Basically saying, like, all the guys were like, stop showing Taylor at the game. She was basically saying, I don't care if they're upset. Well, all the Chads and the Brads are now suddenly big Taylor fans. (laughs) Because when she's jumping out of her seat, dropping F-bombs at the refs, I mean, she's now one of us, man. She's all in. And I, I, that's why I said, Taylor said in that Time Magazine piece that she didn't realize how much she missed football. Like, she wasn't a football fan until she started dating Travis. And she's now a big fan. She said as much. And I, I love that about her. I love the fact that she's come around to the NFL and she's becoming just a, you know, a diehard fan, John. Yeah, she's got next quarter on the pool table. So, I mean, she's like us. <laughs> she, she, before you know it, mm-hmm. I mean, she's going to be, you know, slamming beers at the local bar, hanging out, <laughs> uh, doing a little pool, doing the whole thing. Uh, you know, we're going to see her right here in town at some dive bar with Travis, just having a grand old time. And I'm going to be here for it, man. And I'm going to say I told you so. She's turning the corner, and it's, by the way, why I think she will stay away from the 2024 election. I do not think she's going to get political. I think she's realizing she's better off staying away from it. I know she got political six years ago. But guess what? She's 34. People grow up. People mature. People realize where they should not try to influence things. And if you're Taylor Swift and you've got a growing audience in the heartland of America, stay out of the election. There's nothing to gain. And I think she's going to do it. I don't think she's going to come anywhere close to it. 913-408-7957, news in two minutes. Well, we teased it um, all weekend long. Coming up in 10 minutes, we've got a chance to win tickets to see Dr. Jordan Peterson, who's going to be at Cable Dahmer Arena coming up in February. So that is uh, 10 minutes away. It will be a text-to-win contest. We'll give you that text-to-win keyword as you get a chance to win every day this week at 8.45 and then again at 11.45 with Ray Stevens. So Dr. Jordan Peterson tickets coming up, John. I need to go to that. Hopefully some of that would rub off on me. The guy's cool as a cucumber when people are coming at him, right? Oh, he's so good. What makes you say that? Yes. Just a matter of fact, you know. If you watch his stuff on YouTube, it is just gold, man. He doesn't, like, get upset. No. And that's what they want, you know. Yes. And then he's just sincere what makes you say that you yeah know, make you defend it with, yes without attacking you what makes you say a man can magically be a woman one day you know <laughs> yeah. and then they suddenly are fumbling and mumbling mm-hmm. and bumbling over yeah. themselves and boom he wins so he's going to be a cable dommer in february we've got tickets coming up here in 10 minutes on kcmo so we'll give you a text to win keyword uh and that is 10 minutes away all right now the big story coming out of the weekend was this senate staffer who was intimate. I'm trying to use, you know, in the 6 a.m. hour, I was a little more direct. But, you know, now we got kids in the car, you're running errands, so I'm trying to just, you know, do this the right way and make sure I'm kid-friendly. Kids are up, you know, they're off this week, and I I don't want to have to make you change off a 95-7. But the Senate staffer for Ben Cardin, who is a Maryland uh, Democrat senator, Allegedly, although it's not even really allegedly anymore because he resigned and he basically admitted to it in a statement he put out. Took a video that was leaked by the Daily Caller that was shared in a private group for gay men in politics of this staffer uh, sleeping with another man in a Senate hearing room. So this went viral on Friday night. And uh, the staffer was let go the next morning. But the media reaction to this and the way the media has covered this, pretty astounding stuff. 
let's start with NBC News. Here's the NBC News headline over the weekend. Senate staffer alleged by conservative outlets to have had sex in a hearing room is no longer employed. What? Senate staffer alleged by conservative out. No, 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 no. There's a video. (laughs) I'm looking at the guy. Well, I'm really looking at the back of somebody in a Senate hearing room. And it's, you know, it's a graphic video. Please don't find it after you ate your breakfast. Just don't, just take my word for it. But I understand if you want to confirm it yourself, you have to confirm it yourself. But no, I've given you full warning on what's to come. It is the video of a guy's back in a Senate hearing room doing their thing. And the NBC News headline is Senate staffer alleged by conservative outlets. There's nothing that's alleged. I'm staring at a video and the guy resigned the next day. And then the guy who is alleged to have done it put out a statement not denying it. Instead, the statement that the staffer, Aiden Mays Serposky, put out on his LinkedIn page on Friday night read, this has been a difficult time for me. As I have been attacked for who I love to pursue a political agenda. Oh, come on. How dare you? Please, enough with that. You're not being attacked because of who you love. You're being attacked because you're a staffer for a United States senator. And you're filming yourself sleeping with somebody in a hearing room where, like, important things happen. Like, that was the room where James Comey had his 2017 blockbuster testimony on Donald Trump. You know what else took place in that room? Supreme Court nominees are in that room. The 9-11 commission meetings take place in that room. And this guy is, you know, screwing somebody, for lack of a better word, in that very same room, filming it, sharing it in group chats, and then saying, I'm the victim here. No, you're not the victim. I promise you, you're not the victim. Although, you know what? There's been a lot of screwing of the American people in that room for a long time. So maybe this is just kind of, you know. (laughs) We now have it on film. Yeah, exactly. Said the old man. (laughs) Video. So here's how Politico, here's another uh, gem of a media headline. This is how Politico covered this story over the weekend. Cardin staffer linked to sex tape leaves Senate. Linked? Wait, linked to sex? I mean, no, it's literally his tape. He's not linked to it. He is the tape. The tape is his. He put out a statement Friday night and did not deny the tape was his. And left his job, was let go from his job, however you want to frame it, on Saturday. Linked to, that is uh, quite a rich use of the word linked. Pete Mundo, linked to show Mundo in the morning on (laughs) KCMO Talk Radio. No, the, the, the show is mine. It happens to have my name on it. So I am not linked to the show. I am, this is, are my show. This is unbelievable gaslighting by the media, but it's also very much on brand and par for the course. But even by their standards, I didn't think they would go to the well to defend a guy who is filming amateur pornos in the Senate Judiciary hearing room. I, 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 I always thought that there was a line that they wouldn't cross, and I kind of figured Dem staffer filming amateur porno in hearing room wouldn't be a line that they would cross to try to protect somebody because of their political affiliation. But nope, I was wrong. I, I'm wrong once again. I'm happy to admit it. Fine. Okay. Wrong. Yep, I got that one wrong too. Because even I sometimes think there are going to be standards upheld by the media. But, you know, shame on me for thinking that. And I do always oftentimes think to myself, imagine if the shoe was on the other foot. 
Oh, wait, I kind of can. Somewhat similar. I mean, can we start? We don't know the day of this video. We don't know when exactly this uh, intimate moment took place. We just know it got leaked last Friday. But I think we have to give this a day, kind of like January 6th becomes J6. Mm -hmm. So let's just throw out a date. Let's say this was, I don't know, September 26th. Should we start doing S26 and refer to this as a day of American infamy? (laughs) Uh, I I mean, you know, we might as well. Uh, There are people who like to do that all the time, a day that will live in infamy. And by the way, Ben Cardin, the U.S. Senator from Maryland, who had this guy on his staff, he said this about January 6th, which I find awfully ironic now in the wake of what his own staffer was allegedly doing in the Senate Judiciary Hearing Room. January the 6th, like December the 7th and September the 11th, is a date which will live in infamy. I refer to U.S. Capitol as sacred space because it's so much more than a building where the Senate and the House of Representatives meet and conduct business. It is the embodiment of our ideals, our aspirations, and hope, not just to Americans, but also to all of humanity. Wow. What do you think of that, John? I think OSHA would advise some hand straps and safety rails because it's a long fall from the moral high ground, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it so is. It so is. 913-408-7957. Nine one three four zero eight seven ninety five seven. I, I want to hear from you. Just keep it, uh, keep it as PG as you can on the text line or on the phones this morning. You know, Garner's holding down the board. He's doing a great job in place of Mark, but I don't want him hitting the dump button for the first time in his KCMO career. Do you know where it is, Garner? You know where that dump button is? I do. Okay. I am, uh, I am, I am trained on the dump okay. button, so uh, no worries. Okay, good. All right, we got Garner all up to speed on the dump button. That's the first step here. Uh, 913-408-7957 on a Monday morning, 844. Welcome in.